Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Los Angeles-based jazz musician, composer, and producer, Matt DeMera. We talked to him on September 17, 2020, during the COVID-19 lockdown, about his latest 2020 CD, Fool's Journey. Based in Los Angeles since 1997, he plays tenor, alto, and baritone saxophones, flute, keyboards, percussion, and melodica. Along with composing and playing his own music, he has been a very busy session musician and arranger, touring with many musicians over the years. Get to know him. Dig this interview. Let's get into Fool's journey. Talk to me a little bit about, before we get into like kind of the artistic construction of this project, Uh huh. It, it's getting released during a pandemic. What does that mean to you? It's self-released, so I could have waited, but uh, I... Figured uh, lots. It's kind of a chill out record in a lot of ways. So uh, you know, it's a salve. I, I'm thinking it can be a salve or a bomb for um, a lot of people who just need to listen to something pleasant <laughs> that will mellow them out. You know, during yeah. this time. I I did um, wait a while it, because it felt completely uh, inappropriate to release it during the whole George Floyd thing, but that's basically when I finished it, uh, and it didn't feel like the best time to release it then. Um, but uh, I released it a couple months later just because it's it's like everybody's having a rough year. Let me offer something up you know, as a sort of, hopefully as a salve, as some relief, you know. Uh, but uh, in, in terms of it, the timing, pretty much just, I mean, I, re- I went into the studio to re- record it in January, and then I was working on it through February and March. So uh, it just happened to be timed with the pandemic itself. So it's my pandemic record. Yeah. Well, there was one person I was talking to that mentioned that these might all have a very special place in the annals of recorded history because of when they're released. Yeah. So that you know, that's a caveat, yeah, I guess. Yeah, tw- I mean, and we're all going to remember 2020. It's like one of those dates, like 9/11. It's like there's pre and there's post. And you know, it's either a pre or a post 9/11 world. And now, you know, 2020 has pretty much replaced 9/11. I think in terms of like in how we talk about pre and post time, you know, an era of time, these big calamitous years uh, are, you know, signposts for, for everybody. So you're probably right. I mean, any anybody who released anything in 2020, it's going to be remembered just for the date. I think it's probably so magnanimous we can rename the naming convention to uh, before coronavirus for BC. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah BC. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, <laughs> man. Absolutely. So you're you're a native of LA, uh, grew up there, no. correct? Okay. I grew up in Denver, Colorado, not oh, too cool. far from Kansas City. Yeah, and right. So you know, like I I do feel like there's there's a, a little bit of a kinship, um, just in terms of jazz history. Uh, with, I mean, you know, jazz people don't realize that jazz is a very regional, historically regional art form you know so yeah. denver De- and denver has a pretty vibrant if albeit small jazz scene um but there's some world-class players there uh that i learned from growing up there and then uh but also it has a history which i think just because musicians were doing the circuit between chicago kansas city texas you know they they like I think all the, there was a circuit, you know, there was a circuit that, that, you know, Denver was one of the main stops for Midwestern jazz musicians. So I think it does, I think Denver does have, share something with the history. And I actually used, my very, I I used to go to camp, I went to a camp in Emporia uh, that was led by Clark Terry. Yeah. So, yeah who is also one of the great Midwestern, you know, he's from St. Louis. So yeah. Denver definitely has, like, there's there, there's a, 
jazz can be regional, you know, and there's a Midwestern jazz scene and, and jazz history uh, that I feel like that I kind of got uh, raised up in growing up in Denver. Yeah, you know, the great Ron Miles is from there. I mean, there's there's yep. so much that, yeah, you oh, know yeah. I mean? And Go I remember Ron. going, yeah, Ron's awesome. I remember going to, um, I remember going to Denver back in the late 90s. I used to work for a, a firm, and I was there for a while. And I remember it was real cold. It was before Denver really kind of blew up. And I remember I went to a jazz club then, and it was hopping. Yeah. This was like 98, yeah, yeah. and I was like, <laughs> I had no idea that Denver had that kind of vibe, and I was like, "Wow, this is smoking good." Um, yeah. So, yeah. It, yeah, uh, and, and the cool thing about Denver is, it's like you mentioned, Ron Miles. You know, he 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 was one guy who he was a little bit older than me, but we grew up in the same neighborhood, and and we don't know each other well, but I grew up listening to him, and we all we all looked up to Ron, and plus he was very creative, so he he was more coming out of this art ensemble of Chicago kind of vibe. So Denver is such a, uh, the thing about Denver is it's like all the bebop guys and all the fusion guys and all the avant-garde guys, they, you know, everybody knew each other and everybody played everything. Like there was, yeah. there wasn't, the, and this even back in the 80s when it was so polarized during kind of that Winton era in the 80s, you know, when it, when it, it, it yeah, it was just like, you know, everybody was just sort of like picking sides in camps. Uh, Denver was never like that. Like, I grew up playing all different genres within jazz, but then also funk and jazz and soul and punk. Like, Denver is a pretty good punk town. Yeah. You know, and, but then it also has this kind of smooth jazz thing and, and, uh, has the jam band thing, you know, like pretty strong in Colorado. So it was a more vibrant, <clears throat> vibrant um, uh, music scene than one would expect from being a smaller city. And also, there there were great there, like people like, you know, Fred Wesley lived there in the in the um, in the eighties. And uh, there were uh, there's still there's a, a great piano player or some. Several. I mean, I, I would hate to not mention there's so many, but there's a guy named Art Landy who's who's a you know was in one of the early ECM uh, signees, along with Keith Jarrett. Uh, he he's every bit of as that caliber of, of musician, but it's just Denver's a kind of a lesser known place. So certainly, it, it was some place where I could learn how to play from masters, and I think that's the important. Getting out, playing in the clubs. Uh, I don't. The place you went was probably the El Chapultepec. I would imagine. Yeah. Do you remember? Yeah. Do you I, remember? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That sounds right. Yeah. They have jazz sure. every night, and it's just like this. It's just like kind of you know, divey place downtown. And there's like yeah. one room that has a pool table, and like you know, it's like they have music there every night still to this day. Wow. Yeah, good for them, man. So what, how yeah. did L.A. get on your radar? Uh, I basically, a bunch of my friends from Denver who were all kind of serious, professional, aspiring professional musicians moved to L.A. And uh, I had studied in New York uh, or outside of New York at a school called William Patterson College um, in the late, 80s, early 90s, and I was thinking New York, um, <clears throat> but then uh, at, at one point, I just had gone back to, after I was done with college, I went back to Denver, um, and then I was in Europe for a little while. Um, I was in my 20s, so I was trying to try different places, and I had some friends in LA who invited me to come out and visit and check it out. So I did. And uh, I, I kind of, L.A. was, I wasn't really interested in L.A. because uh, I really did think it was just a land of like hair bands and some jazz and neither of which were my thing. So I, I, I was ignorant about the uh, L.A. and how wide a variety of music is going on here. 
Um, but when I did get here, I was playing, I, I kind of hit the ground running in terms of just playing a lot. Um, so basically, I, I, I just wanted to stay wherever the music was. And for me, it just worked out probably because of the people that I knew um, that I was able to play quite a bit. Not really a jazz, you know, I, I, I wasn't playing straight ahead jazz, though. That's the, the, the thing. When I moved to L.A., I basically moved here to just be a session musician and a sideman. And uh, so although there's a jazz scene here and a, and a fairly vibrant one, um, that's kind of not what I was doing at that point. So what do you like the best about being a musician? The thing I like the best is the other musicians that I get to play with. Like I, I, I often pinch myself when I'm in the middle of uh, a performance or a gig with some of these musicians, I'm like, I don't, I can't believe I get to play with this guy. This guy is a genius, or this woman is amazing. This, uh, I can't believe I'm here. Do, when, when are they going to find out that, you know, that it's like I get a bit of that imposter syndrome because I'm, you know, you, you hit a certain, like, level of, playing professionally and all of a sudden you're surrounded by all these amazing musicians. So that's the thing that kind of keeps me, that's what floats my boat about all of this. When we do return to music, when everything kind of gets back and, yeah. and, and, and we get, you get back on the stage, we get back in the crowd, what do you hope people realize about uh, the absence of live music? Um, I hope people realize uh, how, you know, we've been talking a lot about essential workers, and, and I think it's really important during this time that people who are what they call essential workers are need to be honored and um, sort of respected and appreciated more, <laughs> you know, just the people who do the grunt work. And and I don't I don't put music and the arts at the same level at, at necessarily in terms of essential as doctors and, and uh, you know, health care workers and, and people who do the real moving and, uh, and just nuts and bolts stuff of daily life. Um, we can survive without live music for a little while. However, I hope pe what people realize is just how much nourishment we get from live music, uh, how deeply important it is to the culture, to the health of the culture. Um, it's not just, it's, it's not as inessential as we would think. I guess is the way of putting it. Yeah, I agree. So everything's going to come down to this. Everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, but you're living your life. Who do you think you are? Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a deep, that's a deep question. You know, I kind of, uh, who do I think I am? I mean, I read way too much philosophy, so... It, it might not be good, my answer. It might be it might put your readers, to, uh, your listeners to sleep. Uh, but, I mean, I think, I think my perception of who I am is constantly shifting. Uh, I, I don't even necessarily identify myself as a musician. Um, I'm basically kind of a, just a guy, regular guy, who happens to work as a musician, um, who uh, just, that's kind of my job. You know, I, I've, I've, had, I've had a very blue-collar approach to what I do um, in terms of, uh, you know, like, so I, I don't really identify myself as just, I'm a, you know, that's who I am. You know, playing the saxophone, I'm making music, that's who I am. And it's what I do. Um, who I am is probably more of an a, a open question that I, I, I really <laughs> honestly don't have much of an answer for. It's shifting all the time. I, I can say that, that I've chosen a, a maybe 
like a lot of jazz musicians, or a lot of musicians, but particular jazz musicians lead a partic- kind of a monastic kind of existence. You know, that you spend a lot of time just, it's like a simple life and a quiet life, even though uh, uh, during performances it's not simple or quiet. It's pretty exciting. But, uh, you know, I, I spend a lot of time just in in study and in contemplation and, uh, you know, and almost like a kind of like a monk. So I guess I'm, I'm if I was going to answer the question, I guess I'm, I'm Matt, the, Matt the Music Monk. <laughs> nice. <laughs> in terms of how I perceive myself. I, yeah. It, you know, I think people who, who I, I, I do know that, like, I've pretty much just been, I've, my life's been centered around music since I was a teenager. So I think most of my friends and family are basically just like, yeah, that's, He's a music guy. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. That's a great answer. Great way to wrap everything up. Hey, man, thank you for yeah. taking a minute out today to talk with Neon Jazz. Good luck with the album. Stay safe. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, ha- ha- I'd be curious to just to hear from you. What's your, uh, what's your uh, feeling about the album? I really enjoy it, man. I think it's, I think it's just like you said. I think there's a level of this that's really welcoming during this time, I think people need good music to really kind of get their heads wrapped around something else other than what's going on right now. I know we all, we've all had measuring sticks of 9-11 and different things that we've all lived through. Yeah. I mean, I'm a, I'm a kid of the Challenger blowing up and hearing Reagan talk at night about it. And I yeah. think this is, a, this is a whole different thing. This is, and I have kids, so I'm watching kind of how this long you know, line of this year going on and on and on. And if we didn't have art and music and things that distract us from the realities yeah, yeah. of what's going on around it, it would be bad. It'd be really bad. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but, um, and the cover is great. You know, the whole Van Gogh thing. Oh. Yeah. It's, it's cool. I mean, I just, I, uh, just also, I mean, for the, for, for any kind of, um, like kind of, nerds of esotericism uh the 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 album itself the the fool is comes from uh i guess the western tradition of alchemy and hermetics yeah so that's kind of what what inspired just i needed some way to uh, sort of like find my way through composing a lot of different songs and i thought it was as good a uh, 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 trajectory as any to follow. Because what happens is the fool moves through all the different. Basically, it comes from the tarot, and the and the fool is the first card of the tarot, and then he moves through all the other cards of the tarot. So yeah. each one of those archetypes from the tarot kind of was inspiration for a composition, and some of those comp- all the compositions are based on some kind of archetype. So yeah, that that's. For, for, you know, for the for the nerds of the, <laughs> of the you know, it, that's kind of what it, you know, for people who want to go a little deeper and be like, oh, I wonder what it, this all means. Actually, it does have a, a loose uh, significance. Um, again, you know, jazz it has its history of kind of being like a mystical art form, so I also yeah. wanted to put some of that into it. Anyway, yep. uh, right. yeah, and, and and I I just feel grateful that I had a freaking project. Yeah, you know, for this year because the live music is is gone for the for the yeah. time being. So, uh, and, you know, time to go into production. And I and, think there's uh, a lot of people that feel like that too. A lot of musicians. Yeah. Everybody's sort of getting super creative. At least everybody I've I've talked to, people are getting creative. They're they're um, expanding their home studios. They're writing. They're composing. They're shed, They get hit in the woodshed. So um, I think there will be a burst of creativity. Uh, I mean, I, there's I, there's a lot going on now, but uh, after all of this sort of blows over. It, uh, you know, it's not going to be the same world. It's going to be a different world. 
But uh, for those of us who are uh, around and ready to play again, I, I, I expect there will be a burst of, uh, it's, who knows, maybe it'll be like the Roaring Twenties, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, uh, the Roaring Twenties came after a war and a pandemic, so maybe we'll have something like that. Yeah, I'm probably totally. optimistic. <laughs> well, I, I agree. I think they're saying that it happened with the birth of Bebop that were a lot like that. So Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Hey, thanks again. Good luck with everything. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, man. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Los Angeles, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Matt for his time, cool, and music. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.